tonight is extremely important as we recognize a century of women's rights. We have some illustrious guests here. Alex Sanger is the grandson of Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood 100 years ago. In 1969, he wrote his senior thesis at Princeton on his grandmother. At the time, the field of women's history, feminist history, social movement history, at least at Princeton and most other places, did not exist. He was the first person into his grandmother's archives, which he had kept sealed, and was thus the first to uncover his grandmother's past, which he had carefully concealed and his groundbreaking thesis is still cited by historians. <coughs> Alex Sanger is currently chair of the International Planned Parenthood Council and has served as a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Population Fund. He's the author of Beyond Choice, Reproductive Freedom in the 21st Century, which was published, oh, um, about a decade ago. Alex previously served as president of Planned Parenthood of New York City and its international arm, the Margaret Sanger Center International, for 10 years. And today we're going to talk about, well, just what this 100-year history is about. And we're going to have different perspectives on it. We're also joined by Amani Gandhi. She is a recovering attorney turned political blogger, journalist, and women's rights activist. She's the founder of Angry Black Lady Chronicles, winner of the 2010 Black Weblog Award for Blog to Watch and the 2012 Black Weblog Award for Best Political Blog. She's currently co-host of This Week in Blackness Prime. Her work has been featured at thegrio.com, Alternet, and she appears regularly on a variety of progressive radio shows and podcasts. Uh, she has her law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law, where she was a Hardy Cross Dillard Scholar and editorial board member of the University of Virginia Law Review. And finally, Lynn Roberts joins us. She has a BS in human development from Howard University and a PhD in human services studies from Cornell. Since 1998, Dr. Roberts has been a faculty member um, in the Community Health and Social Sciences program of the newly established CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. Prior to CUNY, she oversaw the development and evaluation of several programs for women and youth here in the city, including a comprehensive program for substance-using mothers and their families in Harlem. She is an emeritus board member of the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective and is co-editing with Loretta Ross, Erica Durkis, and Whitney Peoples a forthcoming anthology of reproductive justice. Uh, since 2014, Lynn has been a consultant to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and supported their effort to integrate a sexual and reproductive justice framework in their work. She is the mother of four amazing human beings, aged 18 to 37, and is in constant awe of her grandchildren. So there we go. We're going to begin with Alex Sanger. So take us back... 100 years ago this week. <laughs> Even if it has to be from the documents and not from your own life experience. I, I, I was not there. Um, <laughs> October 1916. My grandmother is 37 years old from an Irish family of steadily declining prospects. A father, as she described him, long on talk and short on work a tubercular mother, 11 kids in the family. She was a lapsed Catholic, married to a Jew, two surviving children, an 11th grade education, two years of nurse's training, but she never got her nurse's certificate, radicalized by her husband, my grandfather, a socialist, spotty career as a labor organizer, some successes, some failures, and a lengthening criminal record. <laughs> Self-educated, soft-spoken, 
but she could hold an audience when she spoke about the maternal and infant mortality she was seeing in this city. I saw her do it when I was a young boy. Gutsy, unafraid to speak her mind. Before October 1916, there is absolutely no evidence she had ever set foot in Brooklyn. <laughs> she had been on the Lower East Side, nursing there, and she went there looking to open a clinic. As one example of what she was seeing there, in the Orchard Street building, which is now the home of the Tenement Museum, mm. the records indicate that the 18 women living there gave birth to 111 children, a birth rate of 6.1, and of those 111 children, 67 survived, an infant mortality rate of 40%. The solution of the city of New York was to open milk stations. My grandmother's solution was birth control. The Comstock law stood in her way. So what to do? Could you go to the legislature and get the law repealed? Not a chance. No member of the legislature would introduce the bill to overturn the Comstock law until 1921 when Assemblyman Samuel Rosamann did that. Patience was not one of my grandmother's virtues. She had learned from her anarchist and IWW colleagues of the benefits of what they called a direct action, which was a euphemism for breaking the law, <laughs> to get attention and build public support. Emma Goldman and Big Bill Hayward were her mentors. She was introduced to them by my grandfather. She had experience in this when she published her short-lived anarchist newspaper, The Woman Rebel, for which she was indicted on nine counts of obscenity, and also when she published her birth control pamphlet, Family Limitation, for which she was also indicted. In its 16 pages, she gave all the recipes for douches and suppositories that existed at that time. The clinic she wanted to open was her test case to overturn the Comstock law. She had seen clinics in Holland when she was in exile from this country because she was under indictment. No doctor in this country would join her in opening the clinic because they didn't want to lose their license to practice medicine. Even though the Comstock law had an exception for physicians prescribing contraceptives for quote, the cure or prevention of disease. And that was interpreted in 1916 to mean that a physician could give a condom to a man so that he did not get VD when he went to a prostitute. A physician could not give contraception to a woman to prevent her getting pregnant. My grandmother was looking on Avenue A on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Five women from Brownsville came to her office at the end of September 1916. They had over four children each. They'd had multiple abortions. Brownsville matched the Lower East Side in what my grandmother called being dingy and squalid. She decided to go out to Brownsville and take a look. She had no money. She went to the doyen of Greenwich Village, Mabel Dodge, who in turn asked Walter Lippmann what he thought of the idea. As Mabel Dodge said, I'm quoting, he thought the idea dubious, and he added, besides, Margaret Sanger is not the person to do it. The money came from a woman, a woman named Kate Crane Gartz from Los Angeles. She had heard my grandmother speak out there. She was the heir to the Crane plumbing fortune. She sent a check for $50 to my grandmother. My grandmother found a sympathetic landlord, a landlord in Brownsville named Mr. Rabinowitz. The rent was $50 a month. She wrote, my grandmother wrote to the Brooklyn District Attorney announcing that she was going to open a clinic inviting to be arrested. She printed 5,000 leaflets in three languages, English, Yiddish, and Italian. That was the population of Brownsville in 1916. Interesting reading from 100 years hence that it reads, mothers, exclamation point, not women, mothers. 
Can you afford to have a large family? Do you want any more children? If not, why do you have them? <laughs> and then in solid caps, do not kill, do not take life, but prevent. She went ahead with her sister, a registered nurse and a translator. She said, my grandmother said, quote, to protect women from ill health as a result of excessive childbearing and equally important to have the right to control their own destinies. To preserve her test case without a doctor, she gave out birth control information only. She did not hand out any diaphragms, but she told women sympathetic druggists in the neighborhood who would give them. She was providing birth control not abortion. She said, I'm quoting, abortion was the wrong way. No matter how early it was performed, it was the taking of life. Contraception was better because life had not yet begun. You know, I'm waiting, still waiting for the national right, right to life people to give her a lifetime achievement award. <laughs> um, <laughs> nine days after being opened, an undercover policewoman came in posing as a patient and was given contraceptive information. The next day, this woman returned with the vice squad. My grandmother was handcuffed, and the reporter from the Brooklyn Eagle had been tipped off and was there. And the Brooklyn Eagle uh, report reads as follows. Mrs. Whitehurst, who was the policewoman, placed Mrs. Sanger under arrest. The little woman, i.e. my grandmother, was at first taken aback, but in an instant, she was in a towering rage. <laughs> you dirty thing, she shrieked. You are not a woman. You are a dog. Tell that to the judge in the morning, calmly responded Mrs. Whitehurst. No, I'll tell it to you now. You dog, and you have two ears to hear me too. My grandmother was not bashful. <laughs> the three were convicted. My grand great aunt went on a hunger strike which made front page news across the country. It was my great aunt's daughter who moved in with the man who wrote the Wonder Woman comic, which he based on my grandmother, oh. Margaret Sanger. You know, I can handle being the grandson of Margaret Sanger. I don't think I can handle being the grandson of Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, my grandmother appealed her conviction and the highest court in New York said that indeed physicians could prescribe birth control to women as well as men for the cure or prevention of, the, of disease and they used a very broad definition of disease which as we know every pregnancy threatens a woman's health. This was a loophole through which my grandmother drove a truck. She went from the solitary clinic in Brownsville founded the Planned Parenthood Federation of America and then the International Planned Parenthood Federation. We at the IPPF, International Planned Parenthood, are in 172 countries. 50 million women a year come to us for our services. We are the United Nations of Women's Health and she started it right here in Brooklyn. She would be appalled we're still fighting this fight and maybe more appalled that one of her grandsons has to do it. <laughs> a final quote. A woman stood up in the clinic during the, those 10 days it was open. My grandmother described her as having been married 15 years, the mother of seven living children and four dead ones. And she had undergone multiple self-induced abortions. And this woman stood up and said, and I'm quoting, they come to us with their charity when we have more children than we can feed. When we get sick with more children for trying not to have them, they just give us more charity talk. I tell you that someday they will erect a monument to Margaret Sanger on the spot where she came to help women like us. We're still waiting. Thank you.
before we move on, Alex, a quick question. As the daughter of a woman's historian, I was so interested that you were the first to open your grandmother's archive, that it was sealed. Where did you do it, and what was it like to go through it? What kind of condition was it in? Um, the archives, she divided them between the Library of Congress and Smith College. Um, before the war, World War II, she gave a lot of her papers to the Library of Congress because she thought this country was going to get bombed. And the library had a very deep vault, which she thought was going to be safe for her materials. She kept back all the really salacious material, uh, the love letters, the diaries. And after the war, she gave them to Smith College, which had given her an honorary degree, the only honorary degree she ever got. Um, she kept them sealed because they were, they were scandalous um, and personal. And she had a, um, uh, quite a love life, to say the least. Um, and... Um, and she, and she kept, she was a squirrel, she kept everything. So she died in 1966 and I started my work uh, the next year. And literally they were, they were unpacking the, these sealed boxes and, and dust and mites were, were everywhere. Um, and they weren't organized at all. Um, but I read, you know, I, I, I went right to the diaries. I, I, <laughs> I mean, how could I resist? But I, but I knew nothing of this, my father never, talked about his mother's personal life. Um, he, he could barely talk about her at, at all. I mean, his, his life was, growing up was, was horrid. Uh, it was terrible. Um, and I mean, he was in boarding school at, at age five. Um, and the letters from him to his mother, which I saw there, are, are heartbreaking. Um, when he finally learned how to write, he would write things like, well, can I come home for Christmas? I mean, things, things like that. Um, but then, then, I, then I, of course, I mean, reading the diaries, I mean, her, the lovers, you know, Havelock Ellis, H.G. Wells, I mean, you, you name the, the literati. Um, she was kind of like the alma mater of the United States. I mean, she was <laughs> sleeping with everyone of importance. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, it, 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 to call it an eye-opener eye was the understatement of, of the year. But she kept the drafts of all of her speeches. She kept calendars of her travels. And, and back then, you were traveling by train and by ocean liner. Um, and she was on the move her entire life. And she never sat still for a moment. Um, when she would come to visit us, I grew up in Mount Kisco, um, she'd no sooner drop off her suitcase, she'd get on a train and come into the city to raise money, give a speech. Um, so she, she was a driven, driven woman, and her, her papers uh, reflected that. Hmm. So, um, for a well-rounded discussion about this history, we turn to uh, Imani Candy, uh, Gandhi, which rhymes with candy, um, right. talking about the complicated history of Margaret Sanger and what this hundred years, your assessment of it. Um, so I'm sitting next to you, and I hope I don't offend you <laughs> in any way. Your grandmother was an, was an amazing woman, um, and one of the reasons I became interested in her work and her life is that um, I spend a lot of time arguing with people on the internet, and <laughs> a lot of the people that I argue with are anti-choicers, and because I'm a black woman and because I do believe in reproductive rights and reproductive justice, I get the sort of anti-choicer that likes to wield my identity as a cudgel against me. So I get a lot of, oh, Margaret Sanger is trying to eliminate the black race, or you know, Planned Parenthood is trying to kill black people. Um, it ha you have so much, I just got a tweet just now, you have blood on your hands <laughs> because you know, Margaret Sanger is trying to kill your people, um, which is not true. Patently untrue, um, but because I didn't have the facts to marshal at hand, I decided to go and do my research, read some, um, some of her work, read some of the interviews um, that she gave, and I want to start off with a quote to sort of give you a sense of who she was and give you a sense of my surprise to find out that this is the kind of person that she was. So she gave an interview um, with Earl Conrad for the Chicago Defender in 1945, in which she said, quote, discrimination is a worldwide thing. It has to be opposed everywhere. That is why I feel the Negro's plight here is linked with that of the oppressed around the globe. The big answer, as I see it, is the education of the white man. The white man is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> 
It is the same as with the Nazis. We must change the white attitudes. That is where it lies. So for someone who wanted to eliminate the black race, that's kind of a forward-thinking, anti-racist position to have in 1945. Um, and as someone who spends a lot of time talking about the sort of div the, the divide or the, or the split between black feminism and white feminism, and as someone who encourages white feminists to sort of step outside of their comfort zone and think about what it must be like for people who live at the intersections of several identities, whether it be race, or gender identity or sexual orientation, um, I was really heartened to read that, you know, one of the quintessential, you know, she could be called like white feminist zero, you know, one of the quintessential white feminists had these very forward thinking views about race. And so, you know, one of the things that I find myself battling against are, is sort of this meme, this meme culture, you know, and I'm sure you've all seen it on Facebook and Twitter, especially with respect to this current election. You know, you just get, a, get an image, write something on it, you know, and send it out, and that's supposed to be facts. So you get a lot of um, these images with Margaret Sanger's picture on it, with these quotes that are supposedly attributed to her, but upon reflection or upon um, further research, you find that either she didn't say them at all, or she did say them, but when placed, when taken out of context, they sound horrible and racist and vile, but when placed in context, they sound anything but. Um, primarily what I'm thinking about is um, this one particular quote, which I'm sure you've all heard, where, where um, she is quoted as saying, we do not want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. And so when you hear that, we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, you think, well, Christ, you know, she's trying to exterminate the Negro population. She's trying to hide it. Um, but that's not what the case was. The, 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 the case was that she was trying to work with very prominent black leaders at the time to bring birth control to southern, to southern black women. Um, and it wasn't just that, she, it wasn't only something that she was spearheading, but it was something that she worked with people like Adam Clayton Powell, W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary, um, Mary McLeod Bethune. We're talking very prominent people who saw what she was doing with birth control in, in primarily white communities and thought, well, why, isn't, why aren't these services being brought to black communities? And so she worked with W.E.B. Du Bois in Harlem to open up a, a clinic. Um, and he, along with other prominent black leaders, said, we need to bring this sort of contraception to the South. And, they, and, and in their view, it was racist that those types of services weren't being brought to the South in a way that would permit Southern black women to um, you know, take, con take further control of their own pr reproduction. Because as... Um, it should be clear to everyone, black women have always controlled their own reproduction. Um, you know, I, I often say that black women birthed this country. And that's actually not that far off of a statement, considering that black women were used as basically brood mares to, to birth future generations of slaves that would go on to basically create this, you know, the American economy and indeed the global economy. Um, so the concern was that black women in the South weren't given the opportunities that black women in Harlem, black women in the North were given to, to use birth control and to make sure that they were able to control how many children that they had. Um, one of the other um, primary quotes that um, is attributed to her <clears throat> is, hang on one second, um, quote, the mass of Negroes still breed carelessly and disastrously with the result that the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from the portion of the population least able to rear children properly. And so that sounds sort of terrible too. I mean, this mass of, you know, breeding Negroes, careless and disastrous, um, that sounds terrible. But when you, when you dig deeper into it, you will find out that this quote was directly taken from W.E.B. Du Bois, which he wrote, he wrote this quote in an article for her 1932 edition of the Birth Control review. And so the, the, the problem with reckoning with Margaret Sanger's past is that we tend to want to think about birth control as something that was done to black women as opposed to something that black women enthusiastically participated. And so one of the main the projects that she developed and that anti-choicers hang on to as evidence of her desire to exterminate black people is the Negro Project. And the Negro Project I mean, first of all, who says Negro anymore, right? So it sounds bad in and of itself, but the, the project wasn't about trying to figure out how to sort of make sure that black women were breeding, breeding less, but rather to bring birth control to black women in the South in a way that would enable them to take control of their reproduction. And so part of the issue was that 
black people were very skeptical of white doctors, and with good reason. Um, and so the idea was to make sure that black people were getting information about contraception from other black people, from the church, from ministers, from black doctors. And so that's why um, you, know, you get this, this, this sentiment that we don't want the word to go out that we're trying to exterminate the Negro population. Rather, we want that word, we want the word of contraception to go out through black people, through the black community. Um, and, and so in, when it comes to the role that um, Margaret Sanger plays today in terms of Planned Parenthood's history, um, I think that Planned Parenthood has rightfully spent a long time championing, planned, um, championing Margaret Sanger. But I think what needs to happen um, going forward is a reckoning with her more deplorable views. And she did hold rather deplorable views, not, necess not about black people, but about the so-called quote-unquote feeble-minded, um, morons, imbeciles. And these are all terms that were, these are all medical terms of the day that were used to describe mentally disabled people. And so her viewpoint was that we needed to make sure, um, um, and she dabbled in eugenics, she absolutely dabbled in eugenics, but her viewpoint, when she talks about wanting to create a better race, now when we think about creating a better race, we automatically go to this idea that we need to you know, eliminate people of color and focus on white people. But that's not really what her, that's not what her, her, her point was, and that's not what her effort was. Her effort was to make a quote unquote better race by eliminate, eliminating the so-called feeble-minded. And while that sounds horrible, um, and while that is something we should absolutely decry today, it's important to recognize that this country was gripped by this idea of eugenics at the time. Um, it was something that, that people, were, uh, that was taught in high schools. Um, they, there were contests, there were contests at these country fairs where they would have these fitter family contests where they would essentially treat human families like they were livestock and sort of rate them based on their superiority. So this idea that, you know, Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist and she wanted to murder black people. No. She was a eugenicist in the sense that she wanted to create a better race of people, meaning a, a fitter, more, more um, able-minded race of people, but she wasn't necessarily tying reproduction to ethnicity or to race as we think about it. So she actually had a very compassionate viewpoint of the troubles that women of color, black women at the time had in terms of their health, in terms of poverty, in terms of making a, a world for them where they could raise children, raise the children that they have, and then also prevent having children that they could not afford to have. And so I wanna um, read one more quote. Rose to control their birth rate, to reduce their high infant and maternal death rate, to maintain better standards of health and living for those already born, and to create better opportunities to help themselves and to rise to their own heights through education and the principles of democracy. And I'm sure, as, as um, will be discussed later, that's almost a tenet of reproductive justice in terms of making sure that women can raise the children that they already have. And so, so much of what the anti-choicers like to do is talk about how you know, shameful it is that women are killing their babies and killing the unborn, unborn and you have blood on your hands, but they're so incapable of understanding that so many women who are trying to maintain the families that they have just don't have the resources to have more children. And that's by and large, the fault of the same people who are castigating Margaret Sanger as some sort of horrible eugenicist racist who wanted to murder all black people. I mean, these are um, typically conservative people who pay no mind to the sort of impoverished nature. I, I, I like to say that America is a hostile birthing country, a birthing environment for a lot of people in that so many of the women who choose to get abortions already have children. And because they are unable to raise the children that they have because of things like you know, the decimation of public assistance, the, uh, the inability to get uh, affordable childcare, the healthcare system, which has gotten better since the implementation of the, you know, the Affordable Care Act, but which still presents a problem when it, comes for, when it comes to women trying to control their own reproduction, women trying to access contraception. I mean, we're still fighting in the courts women's accessibility to contraception, which is ludicrous and which I'm sure your grandmother would be you know, appalled at. Um, and, and so in terms of the ways in which I think that her legacy should inform Planned Parenthood's work going forward, I, and I think that just in terms of anyone who considers themselves a reproductive rights advocate or a reproductive justice advocate is more about how do we how do we talk about birth control and con contraception as it relates to 
disability and not so much as it relates to race. And so I do think that she was relatively, relatively ableist. I do think that was also a product of, of the time that she lived in, in that everyone was relatively ableist. And certainly at the time, almost everyone was racist. I mean, we had, there were several presidents that were actual, actually members of the KKK. So when people come to me and talk about, well, how can you as a black woman support Planned Parenthood because Planned Parenthood is trying to murder your people, I think to myself, well, if I'm supposed to divest myself from any anti-blackness in this country, I would have to divest myself from this country as a whole because this country was built on anti-blackness. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you walk down Wall Street, there were slave auctions on Wall Street, Brooks Brothers, almost every insurance company actually insured slaves as property. The train, uh, the, the, some of the, the train magnates, you know, traveled, they, they shipped the slaves back and forth from various regions. So I, it's not feasible to expect black women in this country to feel some sort of way about Planned Parenthood without asking us to reject this country as a whole. And so that's, that, that's how I see my role in this discussion is to talk about what does Planned Parenthood mean to the black community? What does Margaret Sanger mean to the black community? And indeed, I find myself having conversations with black women who are quote unquote pro-life and it disheartens me to hear the way they have bought this, the line that Margaret Sanger was this virulent racist who wanted to kill black people, because that's not who she was. But that is not to say that some of the eugenic, eugenicist ideas that she held and she promoted and she latched onto are responsible for some of the stereotypes that we have of black women, because birth control has been used lately as a form of reproductive autonomy, but in, in its inception, it was used as a form of population control. And so when we start having conversations about population control, that's where the rubber starts to hit the road. And so I think that if, um, to the extent that Planned Parenthood is going to move forward and reckon with Margaret Sanger's past, I think it needs to be through a lens of disability and through a lens of, of agency of black women. Imani, before we move on, <laughs> and you're still sitting next to each yeah. other, <laughs> before we move on, what surprised you most in your research about Margaret Sanger? Um, the, her anti-racist uh, sentiment surprised me a lot. Um, that was something I was not expecting to find. That is something that is absolutely um, unusual for that time period. As I said, there were members of the KKK who were presidents. The KKK, I feel like a lot of people don't understand that the KKK was a political force. It wasn't just some sort of club that you know crazy white folks joined, but it was, I mean, it was that, but. <laughs> But it was also a very, a very strong political force in this country. So, you know, one of the things that anti-choicers like to say is, um, is well, she, you know, she was a member of the KKK. Well, she, no, she wasn't a member of the KKK. But when I actually heard people saying that, that kind of piqued my interest. So I went to go and figure out where that meme had come from. And where it came from is that she was, you know, she was practically obsessed with birth control. I mean, she wanted to bring birth control to the masses. And so in her endeavor to do that, there was really no one that she wouldn't talk to about it. And because the KKK was such a powerful political force, she went and spoke to the ladies of the KKK. I believe it was 1937 in New Jersey somewhere to talk to them about the benefits of birth control. Now, was that something that I would do, go and talk to the KKK? Well, not as a black woman, certainly not. But... <laughs> But, you know, is it something that I, you know, am I cool with the fact that she went and talked to the KKK? Eh. Do I understand why she did it? Absolutely. Because if you're trying to get something done, who do you talk to? You talk to powerful political forces, and the KKK was a powerful political force. So to sort of circle back to the question you initially asked me, um, it was really her anti-racist sentiment. It was her anti, um, her anti-Nazi sentiment. She's oftentimes accused of being the sort of blueprint for the sterilization programs that went on in, you know, in Nazi Germany. That's actually not true. Nazi Germany's sterilization program was built on just various state sterilization programs. We're talking California, Indiana, all of these states that, and there was even a Supreme Court case in 1927, Buck v. Bell, where the Supreme Court said, I believe it was Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes who said, one generation of imbeciles is enough. And so, you know, to sort of lay the blame of sterilization and at Margaret Sanger's feet, Margaret Sanger's feet is really, really dishonest. So if we want to have a conversation about what sterilization, what contraception means, we need to have a more nuanced and full conversation, I think. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, 
So, um, Len, you're a founding member of Sister Song, uh, the groundbreaking organization advocating for reproductive justice. Can you share with the audience first, what does reproductive justice mean? And how do you see it, how do you see Planned Parenthood being a part of this movement? Okay, well let me just clarify, I'm a early board member of Sister Song. I don't consider myself one of the early founding mothers, just out of respect to those who came before me. I entered a little later in, this, in the second decade, but nonetheless, I have certainly been with them for a long time. Um, reproductive justice um, is a intersectional analysis, human rights-based framework for asserting four key principles, that every human being has the human right to decide when to have a child, um, if to have a child, and when to have a child, and the conditions under which they'll give birth or create a family. Second principle, the right to not have a child and the means to prevent a pregnancy or terminate a pregnancy. Third principle, to have children and have the means to support them in a safe environment, in a safe community, without threat of violence from individuals, from institutions, or from the government. And the fourth principle is the right to um, bodily autonomy and freedom from any form of sexual or reproductive oppression. And when all four of those conditions exist, we'll, we would have reproductive justice. So in light of both of the, the previous speakers, and remind me never to follow either of you again <laughs> on a panel. Um, I would say that it's interesting because I, if I had to place Margaret Sanger in the present time, I would say she's an ally in training to the reproductive justice movement. And Truth be told, she's not that far different from many of the allies I interact with, where I think what both Alex and Imani shared are examples of the complexity of, of where we were then, but where we still are today in many, many, far too many respects than we probably care to admit or realize. Um, and why do I say that? I say that because, um, to say someone is a racist or not is, is a cop-out. Because as, as Imani said so clearly, we have all been socialized and raised in a racist society, in a classist society, in a homophobic society, all of those things, uh, an ableist society that um, mean however we were, that however we were, wherever we were positioned in this hierarchy of inequality, that we have to unlearn and do better. And that's where the complexity of it gets lost when we decide to, first of all, accept the binary of being pro-choice or pro-life. And one thing that the reproductive justice movement brought to the forefront and which um, made it very appealing to me is that that's a false dichotomy, that there's complexity in all human lived experience, and so we have to acknowledge that we, we don't have to pinpoint Margaret Sanger to have been good or bad, good or evil, um, racist or not, or any of those things because she was human and she chose and made decisions in her time period that were radical and progressive and things that were re regressive and not. So, and yes, what that means is that we are all doing those same things <laughs> still today. Um, so when we, we make this um, more polarized view of things, we don't get at how we will um, move us all beyond um, where we are um, to, a better, to a better world where we have reproductive justice, I'll say. Um, and the other thing I think is important to, to consider is just how much, um, as we think about that today, uh, what that requires of us. Um, so it's not folks having to admit or say that they are racist, it's more to be able to look at the complexities in which we do things that are racist, 
And I think in one of your um, writings, you, you quote Jay Smooth, he talks about the behavior and not the person. Um, so if we look at some of the, the um, what I think are some of the more critical things that Margaret Sanger brought to us is that she brought all of her complexity for us to look at, and we are fortunate to have an archive and, and Alex to, to share that with us, is the idea of, um, of pleasure, that her, her ideas about contraception and, and her own sense of autonomy and pleasure, but that that also taking the context of a family um, and what that meant during those times um, for her to have that life and the sacrifices that that meant. So how do we make choices in today's um, times that allow us to make the best choices for ourselves and not be judged and not to think that contraception is a magic bullet that's going to rid women of, of um, you know, take them out of poverty or it's going to boost the economy, which is some of the framing today that I find problematic as a reproductive justice activist that I wouldn't call folks eugenicists for saying that or that it is population control, but it does make me pause because it gets away from people's individual true autonomy. Um, and is usually coming from a good place, right? Good intentions. We know about, you know, what's paved by that. So if we can think of how in every decision that gets made about reproduction and even non-reproduction, right, that it's so much more than just about whether women have children or not, um, that we're really talking about accepting that we all have to figure this out and support each other. And how we do that is shaped by policy, is shaped by institutions um, that can get into the business of providing a service and have to maintain themselves based on certain um, assumptions that are made, as opposed to kind of working ourselves out of having to do this. Because if we really got to a point where we had um, all of those four conditions met, the four principles, we would be less concerned about contraception and right to abortion because if those things existed, we, we wouldn't necessarily need either, or at least not in this, the way we think about it today. So I don't know if that answered your question fully, Amy, but um, I think there's a lot of potential for us to do more um, dialogue with one another around really difficult conversations to have um, across race, across gender, across sexuality, across neighborhood. Um, I'm fascinated by the, situ the context of 100 years ago in Brownsville compared to Brownsville today and the folks who were you know, in um, Harlem and neighborhoods, um, even when we talk about the, the black Americans who um, supported the work of Margaret Sanger and wanted access to contraception, some of, you know, people wouldn't call them racist. W.E.B. Du Bois or Martin Luther King would not be called racist. But could we call them elitist? Um, who considered um, that, you know, poorer families should have fewer children. And how different is that today when we say that women would be less poor if they had fewer children? It's a very thin line between those two distinctions. And they're very subtle, and that they seem to be um, things we need to talk about more, more frankly. Is it fair to say that the reproductive justice movement has been quite skeptical of Planned Parenthood? And what can Planned Parenthood take from the RJ movement? Um, I can't speak for all others. <laughs> so I'll, I think the skepticism has been when it hasn't appeared, and it's, it's not unique to Planned Parenthood. <laughs> it's, it's a whole host of organizations engaged in sexual reproductive um, health care um, and services, um, many of whom have been at the forefront of uh, mostly um, protecting the right to, to an abortion, um, is that there have been issues that, because of the intersectionality of life um, for women of color, um, indigenous women, um, differently abled and LGBTQ uh, folks, that um, oftentimes when there are issues that impact us, um, Planned Parenthood and other organizations haven't stood with us as solidly as we've stood with them because we 
have needed to stand with Planned Parenthood to, in order to still have access to services that our communities depend upon. Um, and I guess the best, the clearest example was the personhood bill in 2005 um, in Mississippi. Um, there was an initiative for personhood, which was tied to um, restricting abortion, and another initiative around voter ID laws, um, which was restricting the rights of you know, people of color to vote. So there was an opportunity to coalesce around both issues and support things that would have enhanced things for for many poor and people of color, and that opportunity was lost. So one initiative passed and the other one didn't. The one that got the support of those protecting the right to choice were not as rallied against the right to protect um, you know, the voting rights. And that's just one example um, that we, you know, we've been having conversations about this for a number of years now, so I think we, we, we're getting better. Um, there's still a lot more work to do. Um, it has to do with our messaging, um, you know, what gets your, your priorities and your policy setting agendas around, around these, these other issues that are core, that are, you know, is it about whether um, poor women, how many children they have, or is it about getting them out of poverty, <laughs> and what will that take? And those are the types of mobiliza mobilizations um, that we are talking about, how we do that and do that really strategically better than we are now is, is, is where we're at. And I think, um, again, we don't want to have to always be the ones calling folks out. We want to call folks in, but we also would like for you to kind of go for that without us having to call you out about it. Um, because, um, you know, there's folks, um, you have power, you have power and can wield influence in, in places and at tables that many um, women of color just don't have that kind of access. So what are the conversations you have, not just among those of us who all kind of agree and, and think reproductive justice is a wonderful way to go, but what are the conversations you have with the folks who don't feel that way? And does, does, does reproductive justice come off your tongue in those places as much as it comes you know, out in, when we're present? <laughs> and it's not just what you say in public, it's what you say in private. Uh, and, and I think we have to find ways um, for more of that to happen. So get ready with your questions, but <clears throat> before you raise them, Alex Sanger, your thoughts on what you've just heard, the, these critiques, um, what did you learn from other people's perspective on your grandmother, or is this something you've been understanding for quite some time? Well, about uh, probably five years ago, I wrote a, um, an article for a feminist magazine about these issues and about my, my grandmother's uh, unfortunate uh, dabbling in, in eugenics. So I'm, I'm familiar with every word she ever wrote on it, and you know, I find uh, her off base and, and, and in this uh, these instances really deplorable the things she said um, so it's it's upsetting to have uh, to to see that and, and face that um, I'm, I'm reminded of just a couple of thoughts though because we are semi in a historical building um, at her trial in 1917 one of the police officers accused her of trying to eliminate the Jewish race one of the languages with Yiddish. So that came up out of absolutely nowhere. Um, at, at that point, she had never, I don't, th I don't think, uttered the word eugenics or, or talked about it, but it was in the air back then. Um, you know, Theodore Roosevelt started it all. He was, he, he was a horror in many ways. Uh, but he, he accused the white race of committing race suicide by having uh, not as many children as he thought they ought to have. Eugenics was much more respectable than birth control. So it was, it was a political calculation of my grandmother's part to try to be respectable. Big mistake. Um, and she talked about, it, it was, um, uh, we, we don't think about these things. The draft was initiated in 1917 for the, for the First World War. One third of the men called for the draft were rejected on account of their health. Um, the health of American adults um, in this country, and she, my grandmother was seeing a, the American children, their health, in this 40% infant mortality rate, 
in New York City, but the, the adults that survived were in rotten health. And um, you, you talk about her focus on the children that women already had, that, that was that's really a key point. Um, because when she was nursing, she saw the children that women already have, and she saw what an additional child or two or three could do. And the, the final irony about uh, eugenics, you, you look at her as a person, which is why, why I started out giving this somewhat sordid family history. Um, her father was an alcoholic. Her mother was tubercular. She was Irish, poor, married to a Jew, with a criminal record. I mean, she had six counts of not being able to reproduce, according to eugenesis. Um, and yet, for these you know, strange political and nursing background and other things, looking for respectability and other things in her life, she, she you know, got into this uh, where she shouldn't have. Um, and uh, maybe it was a danger of being self-educated, because she was. And she was very influenced by all these brilliant, brilliant men that she was around, all of whom were eugenicists. I mean, H.G. Wells was the worst, and Havelock Ellis. Um, and a big, 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 big mistake. Um, but the, you know, I'm so glad you brought up the Harlem uh, history, um, because when I've been up there in the past, um, and talking to people who've lived there a long time, they remembered that clinic, um, and that she had brought it there with uh, the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Sr. And, and, and the others in the black community, and uh, uh, no one else was doing that but her. You know, at the risk of getting into electoral politics today, <laughs> I don't think you could talk about Planned Parenthood without doing that. Um, and I wanted to ask Imani, as you talked about, you know, the Klan, it being a powerful political force. For some people here, they might think, well, wow, that was a very long time ago. It's hardly a powerful political force. We might have said that until maybe last year. Um, right. Can you talk about... Um, what that resurgence has meant, and that both the Klan and the issue of women's rights now in 2016, major themes, amazingly enough, who would have ever thought it in the 2016 presidential election? You know, I'm kind of glad that we've had this sort of resurgence of white nationalism because it has, and it's, it's going to get better, trust me. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, I know. But in the, you know, starting in around 2010, 2011, um, you started to see these billboards, right? These billboards about the, you know, the most dangerous place for a child is in the black womb. And so you had these accusations that black women were participating in some sort of self-genocide to where... You know, the, the abortion rate in the black community is so much higher than it is um, for the white community, any other race. And that is because of the lack of access to contraception, the lack of access to health care, um, and those sorts of things. But as they would have you believe that for some reason black women have just decided we shouldn't exist anymore, and so we're just killing ourselves out, which is a ludicrous thing to say, um, but that is something that they have argued. And this, the way that they are framing it, it is almost as if they want us to believe that they actually care about black women and black children when it's very self-evident that they don't. And so this, re this rise in white nationalism sort of, I think, it, it dovetails very nicely with what I've been saying for years, which is that you don't give a crap about, sorry, I almost cursed, you don't give a crap about black women and children. You are using black women and children as a cudgel to reduce abortion access in order to make sure that but the better stock, white, wealthy white women, are having more children. So in a very kind of odd way, they are championing eugenicist viewpoints. But they're, trying, they're couching it in terms of, well, we really care about what's going on in the black community, when you don't. They don't. I mean, if they did, that they would, they would focus on things that would help women, help black women raise the children that they have, help black women have better health, better jobs, better childcare, better education, all of those things. They don't care about any of those things. They care about black fetuses until those black fetuses become black children, and then they become black adults, and then they're gunned down in the streets, and then they're championing and saying blue lives matter. So it's... 
so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're having this sort of overtly like vintage racist sort of thing going on now because it's brought a lot of, it's brought it out of the basement and into the light. And I think it's an important discussion for people to have. And the only thing I'll add is that Lynn also, Roberts. it's not necessarily a resurgence yeah, yeah. Uh, because those yeah. of us who've been doing reproductive justice work, you know, trace it back, you know, you know, since the inception of the, of the country, but also specifically around even Roe v. Wade uh, when political decisions were made and compromises were made. Again, similar to your grandmother around you know, getting that passed had a lot to do with concessions to the Dixiecrats of the South. Um, and we have to acknowledge that painful truth too. Um, and, and those things, again, um, in terms of who do we consider you know, to be the arbiters of power, um, you know, how close are many of us to them? You know, you know, they're in our families, I suppose, right? Um, I'm not speaking of my own. I don't have many of those. Mine are more likely to be on an FBI list. But, um, <laughs> but nonetheless, to be able to, you know, really, um, I agree with you, to see it more visibly, but what are we going to do about it since it's so blatant now that, you know, as, as much as we can talk about it strategically, what, what do we see as, as our, um, you know, modus operandi to really get at the core of it and, and turn that around and withstand it because it's so um, now entrenched in our, in our mainstream media um, and in our, um, you know, kind of, it's the order of the day. Um, and we can, and it's become, like you said, it's become these memes <laughs> instead of, um, you know, critical analysis uh, about um, moving us beyond the buzzwords and the sound bites um, to real um, transformation of the country that we want to have, that we've never had. Um, you know, there's nothing to go back and say we want to, you know, make America great again. It hasn't been that yet. So let's just, um, you know, think about ways that, the, again, I think it comes down to how we have these critical dialogues with each other um, and then lead that to action. And I believe in direct action um, as one means, but it's not the only means. I also believe in infiltration <laughs> of, of powerful places um, in whatever way we can. And so I think of that, and I have the good fortune of teaching in the academy, so I, I like to um, contribute to those infiltrators' <laughs> development um, as much as possible. So let's open up this discussion to all of you, because you're here for a reason. You deeply care about Planned Parenthood. and. Um, the role it has played and the role it can play. Um, who would like to make a comment or ask a question? Well, as people, go ahead. Um, thank you very much, all, all of you. Um, I'm on the national board of Planned Parenthood. And can I'm a you, preacher. Can you tell us your name? Uh, Reverend Tim McDonald from Atlanta, First Iconium Baptist Church. Been in a lot of videos about Planned Parenthood. Um, I've learned a lot tonight. I really, really have learned a lot. Uh, but one of the things that I'm sort of for me, like the elephant in the room, is the role of religion in the whole history. And all the concept, whether it's reproductive justice, reproductive choice, eugenics, it, it seems like for me it's the elephant in the room that doesn't get enough conversation, enough attention, because at the root of power, at the root of policy in this country, whether it's in the North or the South, the role that religion has played in reproductive rights has virtually been... Um, not acknowledged enough, in my opinion. So my, my question is, you know, given your various perspectives, um, what role do you see that faith has, has played in the whole discussion? Because I haven't 
heard it mentioned here, and I think it is at the crux of Roe v. Wade and what's going on right now in this election and who's behind a lot of stuff in this election. The ones who elect the people who set these crazy policies are people of faith, and they are the ones pushing it. So given your historical perspectives, what role do you see that faith has played and is playing, even in the, in the arenas in which you are, are concentrated? <laughs> I'll start. I'll start. Um, thank you. Um, when my grandmother started out, every, every, every religion, every denomination was opposed to her, without exception. Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, opposed. The first group that came around to support her uh, 15 years after the clinic was opened were the Anglicans in England, the Episcopal church here. I spend most of my time now working in Latin America, Catholic countries. And it doesn't matter whether the government down there is left wing, right wing, or somewhere in the middle, they oppose us. And religion down there in Latin America infiltrates, permeates the society, the decision making. And yet the women are coming to our clinics by the millions. Um, it's great that there are denominations out there that uh, support Planned Parenthood, support reproductive rights, reproductive justice, um, because then we can say that the Catholic Church and the fundamentalists do not have a monopoly on God. Um, and we need to uh, be able to say that louder and louder and uh, counteract uh, not just what's happening in this country, but what I see around the world. So. I'll just say, I don't have much to say. I just have one quick thing to say. Um, with respect to um, like the Negro Project and the clinics that she developed, she did want to, in working with people like um, W.E.B. Du Bois and Adam Clayton Powell, I think she recognized that the black church was sort of the center of the black community, especially in the South at the time. And so they endeavored to, to use that to their advantage by talking to ministers and, and churchgoers and, and and using them to spread, you know, spread the good word about birth control. But part of the problem with that is that even though that they were sort of nominally using ministers to, to, to spread the word about birth control, it was still a very much white controlled effort. So it was almost like, we know black folks really love Jesus, <laughs> so we're gonna use ministers to promote our agenda, but really we're not gonna give them a lot of self-control over what that agenda is. And so I find that to be a bit problematic. Yeah, I agree, yeah, absolutely. And I think just to distinguish too between people of faith and organized religion and the control of organized religion, in particular denominations more so than others, and within each of them having you know, a, a continuum of opinion um, but one thing that um, from the inception of the reproductive justice movement as I've entered it, because again, it goes back many decades before it was called that, um, is that um, individual opinions or viewpoints or beliefs should never impact others and the masses. So the reproductive justice umbrella has always embraced folks who might self-identify as being, I would say, pro-life or personally against abortion. Um, but that's not the same as how that gets framed within the work and other people's rights to have their own beliefs and exercising that. And, and, when, and that's, why, again, why the polarization of being pro-choice or pro-life and also being pro-life when you're not against the death penalty or against war needs to be a stronger case made. And I don't know why the reproductive rights and reproductive health movement have never seized on that in their messaging, right? <laughs> or contradicted that, because it gets all hung up on, on a fetus as opposed to all human life, right? Um, and if we were all, all pro-life, I don't have a problem with being pro-life. I claim that. I personally claim that. But this is what it means to me. 
And just like our, our movement, reproductive justice, had been twisted and the civil rights strategies were even used against us in the whole you know, billboard campaigns, I don't know why we couldn't do the same thing with that pro-life rhetoric, but again, the continuum that needs to exist is one that's, that suggests that we can all have different beliefs, but we can't dictate that to others in a, in a you know, free, self-determining um, you know, world. So I think the engagement of the faith community of various faiths, um, you know, there's so much um, possibility and there's been so much progress because of faith communities too in, in, in the choice movement and the reproductive justice movement. Um, but we have a lot more work to do within particular denominations and, and spaces. And again, that's for me another site of infiltration. And I, I, I use that probably very um, dangerously, but um, we need to stop talking to ourselves, to our echo chambers. And I was engaged for several years with the uh, Unitarian um, Universalists who did adopt reproductive justice as their study issue. I actually started in a congregation near my home in New Jersey, and they were the ones who introduced it to their General Assembly, and it was chosen between 2012 and 2016. And Tony Bon Leonard, founding board member of Sister Song, has been very involved in, in, in having these discussions in the black church. So Google her. And, and, and study her up very well on, on these very issues because there does seem to be this um, perception that the black churches uh, and the Catholic church, of course, in Latin America and elsewhere have been the biggest stumbling blocks, but those are also places where when they poll their congregations, of course, it's the leadership, it's not the people. So remember that, it's not people of faith, it's institutions that use religion to control society. Yes. There's the mic, right there. State your name. And I'm Tanya Milich, and I've been active in the political movement since I was a little kid. And many of the people in this room thought that the politics, the political piece of the choice movement started with Roe v. Wade. And what I mean by that is that the political people then decided to use our issue to gain power in the country. But having listened to particularly Alex tonight, it seems to me that this movement has been political from the beginning. And I wonder if the three of you would talk about pre-Roe v. Wade, that we've been at this for 100 years. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, when this country was founded, birth control and abortion were legal. And the first law that criminalized abortion was in, passed by Connecticut in 1819, I think. Um, and complicated reasons for that, but with a lot of, had to do with white hegemony. The white Protestants wanting to keep their control of this country and the immigrant Catholics, including my ancestors, coming over, having more children than the Protestants. And the Protestants were very upfront about it, um, that they wanted to keep, keep the Protestant women from using birth control and abortion. It was a, it was a cr cradle competition, as it was called. So it's, it's been here from, it's been in this country from the beginning. Um, and just one little footnote, that my grandmother always felt that she had better luck with Republicans than Democrats on, on this issue. Um, and when New York State, let me remind you all, three years before Roe versus Wade, New York decriminalized abortion. Um, it, the votes were, you know, as many Republicans almost as Democrats voted in favor, and it was a Republican governor who signed it into law. So it's, uh, you know, the Republicans were right there for a long time, and now they're... <laughs> I, 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 I won't even... Go um, well, they, they, there were different republic. I mean, yeah, the two the parties kind of flip flopped right. a bit uh, in some ways. You know, so the terms. Why don't, I don't is think that? The same thing. Why have they diverged? And why is this? <laughs> well, maybe Tanya. Has I mean, Tanya is the, the world's expert on this, and uh, 
author of The Republican War on Women, so uh, uh, Tanya, you really ought to talk about it, but it's, it's, there, there are a few Rockefeller Republicans still floating around, but not, not many. Well, you know, she, she had, uh, you know, aside from the women who were lined up outside that clinic in Brownsville, uh, and you've seen them, there's a famous picture of these women with baby carriages and carrying, um, carrying babies in their arms. Um, you know, no one, there was no institution in this country supporting her. I mean, the government was opposed, the press was opposed, the churches, the medical societies wouldn't have anything to do with her. Both political parties were opposed. Um, there, you know, she, she had nothing. And, and you know, it took her five years to get Samuel Rosamond. I don't know, is Liz here, um, Rosamond? But that, that's her father-in-law, and, and Liz was a longtime board member of Planned Parenthood here in New York. Um, and uh, you know, he had the guts to do it, but no, no one else was gonna stand up. I mean, the, the pressure was just too much. Um, and my grandmother never believed that giving the women the right to vote was gonna change anything. Because um, she saw that in the Western states before the Amendment in 1920, uh, women had the vote out in, in Wyoming, Montana, out west, and nothing changed. White women. White women, <laughs> correct. Just clarify. Correct, nothing changed. So she, she, she was into direct action, change, changing the law her, her, her own way. And, uh, you know, politics, um, you know, she became friendly with Eleanor Roosevelt, tried to get birth control into the New Deal programs, totally failed. The New Deal coalition, Catholic inner city, was gonna have nothing to do with birth control. And I would just like to go back earlier than even um, Margaret's time, because if we're talking about the control, from a reproductive justice perspective, it's the control of our reproduction. And that goes back to what Imani talked about in the forced breeding of enslaved African women, um, what was happening um, in terms of controlling our fer fertility at the same time than when we talked started to talk about self-control of our fertility, that was, that was controversial. But before that, there was plenty of you know, you know, effort to control fertility by the state. And also uh, effort to control fertility by slave women them, enslaved women themselves. Naturally, because yes. you know, they would, any children that they bore were not their children. They were automatically property of whomever they were, you know, they were sold to. So, you know, you had um, enslaved women who would kill their infants because rather than see them become slaves for whomever. So, yeah, I mean, that's why I get so very offended by this notion about, you know, oh, they're killing, how can you support Planned Parenthood? They've been, you know, they, they're trying to kill black people. It's like, you know, we, we weren't, in a sense, trying to kill ourselves at the time because the alternative was so much worse. Um, so, yeah. So we have time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> Maybe those, the two of you back there just piggyback on each other. Uh, you each ask a question, then they'll respond. Hi, uh, my name is Pearl, and in addition to being an activist with Planned Parenthood, I'm also a volunteer health center escort at a reproductive health care facility that is not a Planned Parenthood, um, but it's in the city, and um, a majority of the patients are people of color, and it's a high-poverty neighborhood. And one of the things that uh, the protesters always like to scream at the escorts between screaming at patients <laughs> is... Uh, you know, saying, because most of the escorts are white, saying, you know, oh, well, you're just here to kill black babies and, and all that just really frustrating rhetoric. And I, I feel that as an escort, I am supporting women's bodily autonomy and reproductive justice in that the women going into the clinic can make the right decision for them. But I still struggle with the aspects of white supremacy and white savior complexes and things like that. So I guess, how would you recommend that white feminists and white activists be better allies and support communities of color? And the person right behind you. Hi, uh, my name is Britta and I work in health education in New York City. And um, I was thinking a lot about what you were saying 
and talking about different groups that have decided that certain people shouldn't have children or aren't fit to be parents. And so in my work, we talk a lot about, we work with teenagers. And so I was wondering how you think uh, teenage pregnancy fits into a reproductive justice framework and how we should be talking to young people about having children or not having children in a way that um, like isn't telling them that they're not fit to be parents? You probably asked the right person. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a former um, teen parent myself, I, that's why I said that. Um, when we frame teen pregnancy as a problem and something to be reduced, which we do, I work in public health and I do, I spend a lot of time around this issue, um, is that we forget that it's not the age of the parent, it's what is available to them to parent. And so when we use um, arguments that young women having a child at a young age, it dooms them to a life of poverty and, and lost opportunity, that they can't go to college, that they, they won't earn a good income and all those things, that's bull crap. Um, because that's because our society has determined that that will happen because we haven't supported them. My grandmother had children at 16, which is younger than I had my first child, and yet, and I went to college. In fact, I took my daughter to college and to graduate school with me. And if I hadn't had her, I don't know that I would have been as motivated. Um, I might not be sitting in front of you at this moment if I hadn't been a teen parent. Um, and at that time, in 1979, there weren't the restrictions that exist today because policies were allowed to, to be developed that demonized teen parents. So a large part of the reproductive justice movement is changing that narrative because it's very problematic. Um, and that's not to say that a teen parent, a teen who gets pregnant and doesn't want to have a child shouldn't be assisted in coming to a decision not to have a child. But to frame teen pregnancy as a problem in and of itself solely based on age is problematic. And when we've looked at the data, um, Arlene Geronimus, who's a social epidemiologist, if you've read any of her work, she does a good, pretty good analysis about how that plays out differently in different um, contexts um, and comparing different racial ethnic groups. She's um, shown that, a lot, that there's, there's a different outcome for um, an African American who becomes pregnant at a young age where actually her support system engulfs her and she gets support she might not have gotten from her family, that she w might not have gotten not having a child, and for young white teen parents it's just the opposite. Like they get disowned and kind of kicked out of the family for getting pregnant at that age if they decide to have the child. You know, and again, that's a pretty crude summary of the analysis, um, but, the, I, but the bottom line being um, that's about what, what resources are available and which ones are denied as a result of having a you know, becoming pregnant at a young age? And did you have the full range of options in making the decision about the pregnancy? And what was done to prevent it in the sense of, you know, again, having access to comprehensive sex education and all of those things that are still important and also claiming your sexuality and all those things that come with that. But um, I don't believe that we should frame much of our arguments around teen pregnancy as, as an economic problem or as a, um, as solely that, or as, because um, that kind of falls into that whole, it's kind of blaming um, young women um, for the ills of society based on, you know, their reproduction, and I think that's very problematic. And I don't remember what the other question was. About being an ally, I can talk about that a little All bit. Right. Um, and, just in terms I'm, of um, becoming a better ally, just listen to the women that you're escorting, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's very frustrating to have these people yelling those things at you, but the women that you're escorting there chose to go there, and you were just helping them navigate the bullshit. <laughs> so I think that it's an honorable thing to do. I, I have great respect for clinic escorts. Um, and essentially, I think part of the problem is, is that black women have agency when it comes to their reproduction, and so much of the politicization of black women's bodies is stripping them of that agency. and. And, and putting and, and pushing onto them whatever political agenda is, is of the day. So 
for these people to say, oh, you're just here to kill black babies, when then they go home and vote for conservatives and Republicans and whatnot who do nothing to provide resources for a, for a young black woman who might want to have a child or whatever age they are. I mean, it's just hypocrisy. And so just call them hypocrites, <laughs> you know? Just tell them they're hypocrites and just listen to the women that you're escorting. Listen to black women, trust black women. They know what they're doing. We've known what we're doing since we were dragged here. Um, so, I, I mean, and I think it's, it's, it's a good thing that you want to be a better ally. And honestly, and I, and I don't mean to sound glib and I don't want it to come across that way. If you just Google how to be a better ally, there's so much stuff out there. I mean, it's amazing how much, you know, how much information and resources are out there from people of color, from women of color, explaining what they they need from, from white folks who want to become better allies. So just listen and learn, and I don't think you can go wrong. And, and one piece I will add to that, and this is probably more from not the individual context with the young women being escorted, but in the broader movement and in our in organizations, is if you are in a situation and you have your position and you've prepared for your, your job, your career, and you don't see other women of color <coughs> in your immediate environment and having their voice and their leadership respected, you're part of the problem. And I'll just leave it at that. I just want to add one thought, an international comparison. In, in this country, Planned Parenthood have, is in a silo. Re reproductive health services for women occasionally for men, male partners, but it's reproductive health for women. That is not the model of Planned Parenthood in the other 171 countries of the world that we operate in. Um, I just got back from Morocco and I visited our Planned Parenthood there. And in this one neighborhood I was at, the Planned Parenthood not only has a health clinic for women and men, uh, the women of the neighborhood bring their children for all their immunizations, all the pediatric health care, the Planned Parenthood operates an elementary school for the orphans and those who are uh, not otherwise getting educated in this neighborhood. And they have three job training centers there. One is in cooking, how to become a chef, how to become a cook, uh, dressmaking, and hairdressing, or being a, being a barber. And so they're training young men and, and women in career paths. And for the older adults, they operate a hammam uh, for the men and women to come in and get their, their, their baths and, and uh, use, the, use the hammam. It's a community center offering comprehensive health care for whatever that neighborhood needs. Um, and th the word protester or opposition just does not exist. Um, and that's something we need to think about in this country, to be absolutely inclusive for what neighborhoods need, for what men and women and children in neighborhoods need. And Planned Parenthood, I think, is uniquely positioned um, because it is connected to so many communities to take a, take a lead in that and change the model of who we are um, out there. And as we wrap up, the U.S. learn from the rest of the world? Imagine, imagine <laughs> that, right? As we wrap up, as Planned Parenthood enters its second century, very briefly, if each of you could say what you think would be most important for Planned Parenthood to consider or become Well, I just said it, but let me just add that um, to continue the work, I know Planned Parenthood of New York City is doing this um, through Joan and, and, and Katie, the board chair here, um, and the National Planned Parenthood is doing it, and the International is way ahead of both, of diversifying the board and the power of the organization, um, and make the board and the leadership truly representative of the, of the people that we are serving and they, they have to be inside inside the power structure and running and leading these organizations. So. Yeah, along those lines, I think that Planned Parenthood has done a good job, especially in the last oh 
five, four or five years, with, especially with the development of Planned Parenthood Black Community, of becoming less an uh, organization for white women and more an, or an organization for women. Um, I think they've done a really spectacular job, actually, of diversifying, um, making the communities they serve feel as if they are part of the Planned Parenthood community, and I think that's something that should continue. I don't think I have much to add. I think it is still um, early to tell where we're going to go next in terms of having the tough conversations about racism and um, gender oppression as it impacts particular communities. And I think that does mean also um, yielding some of, of, I guess, Planned Parenthood's brand recognition, if you will, <laughs> you know, because people know what bland, you know, share some of those resources that come from that brand um, so that the communities that are served can be self-determining about what, what things might look like, what, what, that they can determine for themselves what they need and, and to support that in a way that um, is meaningful for them and wherever that is. And also to support the areas, we're in New York and we think New York is kind of, you know, ahead of the game a lot of the time, and it, it, it is and it isn't in many ways, um, but to support the areas where, where things are tougher, um, you know, redirect the resources where they need to go. I know of um, some of the women of color who've worked in, in entities in other parts of the country, particularly in the South, who, who feel isolated and alone and sometimes get sent out to the, the communities because they are the face of the community, but they don't have the support from the organization when they go to do that. And you need to, to hear that and hear from them what it takes to do that and, and, and monitor what happens and why people, those same women of color might leave your organization because a lot have come in and when Sister Songs Network first established, you know, we also supported women of color led organizations, but also individuals working in other organizations because, and they were the ones who formed a lot of our membership base. Well, as we, we wrap up, one quick thing. Um, uh, Alex, you just mentioned Joan and Katie, and I think they should both stand up for the work that they do. Joan Mallon is, Joan Mallon is CEO of Planned Parenthood New York City, and Katie Danzinger is the board chair. So we want to say thank you so much for this really interesting evening. I hope just the beginning of a year of conversations about where the reproductive rights movement is in this country. Thanks so much. And thank you, Amy. Thank you.